a very good evening aspirants i welcome you all to the daily hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by shankar as academy for the date 19th of may 2023 displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today now without any delay let us get into our article discussion take a look at this science page article this article is speaking about the issues surrounding the tuberculosis testing this article says that tuberculosis was the number one infectious killer disease of human until the emergence of sars cov 2 which is a strain of corona virus that causes covid 19 see tb primarily affects the poor people and it yields more impacts to low and middle income countries but this is not the same in the case of covid 19 see covid 19 has affected both poor and rich without any bound and it also impacted high income countries so most of the countries in the world have scaled up testing facilities for diagnosis of covid-19 but the tb still gets little attention and investment the article further says that india is heavily reliant on age old sputum smear microscopy method for diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis this method requires the patient to violently cough up sputum from the lungs and the sputum is taken up for diagnosis now if we look at the covid-19 diagnosis india scaled up pcr testing this kind of molecular testing has high diagnostic accuracy and will lead to major improvements in early detection this same method can also be used to detect tb and drug resistant tb but india still majorly relies on microscopy method of diagnosis and it did not invest much in the r and d and in the field of tb diagnosis this is what is discussed in this news article now in this context let us understand about the tuberculosis disease and then about the methods of diagnosis of tb before getting into the discussion kindly note the syllabus relevant to this topic now let us start with tuberculosis tuberculosis is an infectious disease caused by a type of bacterium called mycobacterium tuberculosis tuberculosis usually attacks the lungs but it can also attack other parts of body such as kidney spine and brain know that not everyone infected with tb bacteria becomes sick see there are two types of tb conditions such as latent tb infection and tb disease that is the active tb in case of latent tb infection the tb germs live in the human body but it does not make the people sick whereas in the case of tb disease the person gets sick from the tb germs now how does tb spread tb bacteria spread through air from one person to another see when a person is infected with tb cough speak or sings the tb bacteria can be released into the air so the people nearby may breathe in tb bacteria and they get infected with tb and know that tb is not spread by shaking someone's hand then sharing food or drink and touching bed sheets or toilet seats now talking about the symptoms the common symptoms of tb include prolonged cough chest pain weakness weight loss fever and night sweats certain conditions like diabetes weakened immune system and the use of tobacco can increase a person's risk for tuberculosis disease now coming to the prevention and treatment see tuberculosis is preventable as well as curable tuberculosis disease is treated and almost cured with the use of antibiotics but if it is not treated properly it can be fatal now with this basics let us move on to see about the diagnosis method as we saw in the beginning there are two popular methods available for the diagnosis of tb they are sputum smear microscopy method and pcr that is molecular testing method now first let us see about the sputum smear microscopy method the sputum smear microscopy method is the primary method available for the diagnosis of tuberculosis this method is mostly used in low and middle income countries this is because it is very simple and rapid to conduct the test and it also has a low cost see to carry out the microscopy test the sputum is collected from the suspected person then the sputum specimen will be spread on the microscope slide after that a staining dye is added to the cell of the specimen and then washed in a acid solution further the cells are examined under a microscope see if the cells retain the stain this means mycobacterium tuberculosis are present this is because tb bacteria are usually acid fast which means they hold on to the dye when washed in acid solution this is how the tb is diagnosed using the sputum smear microscopy method However the sputum smear microscopy method has significant limitations in its performance firstly the sensitivity of the microscopy test is grossly compromised when the bacterial load is less than 10000 organisms per ml in a sputum sample secondly this method has a poor track record in extra pulmonary tuberculosis pediatric tuberculosis and in patients co infected with hiv and tuberculosis 
and finally due to the requirement of series of sputum examinations for the diagnosis of TB using this method some patients do not come back for repeated sputum examinations this ultimately lead to poor diagnosis of TB. So, these are some of the issues associated with the sputum smear microscopy method. Now, moving on to see about the molecular diagnosis of tuberculosis. See, the molecular tests are otherwise referred to as nucleic acid amplification test that is NATS. This type of test primarily relies on PCR that is polymerase chain reaction. Know that PCR is a technique used to create several copies of a certain DNA segment quickly and accurately. So, using this PCR method, the TB can be diagnosed at an early stage and it can also be used to detect drug resistant TB. This is because the PCR testing does not require a series of examinations as like sputum smear microscopy method. From the single sample itself, we can create several copies of DNA segments of TB bacteria. And also, the test can be done more quickly than the conventional microscopy method. Because of this only, PCR testing method is also called the rapid diagnostic test. So, Due to this advances in the field of molecular diagnostics for TB, the World Health Organization is consistently recommending the nations to ramp up the molecular diagnostics for the TB rather than relying on old microscopy method. That is all about this discussion. Through this discussion, we have learned about the tuberculosis disease and then about the methods of diagnosis of TB. With these points in mind, let us move on to our next news article. Today, our Prime Minister Narendra Modi is leaving the country for a six-day tour to Japan, Papua New Guinea and Australia. He is travelling to Japan to attend the G7 summit, which is scheduled to be held in Hiroshima from May 19 to 21. After the Japan visit, he will be in Papua New Guinea to take part in the Forum for India-Pacific Islands Cooperation Summit, which is a vital forum to boost the multilateral cooperation. After his visit to Papua New Guinea, Prime Minister Modi will travel to Sydney in Australia at the invitation of Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. All these bilateral and multilateral engagements are expected to strengthen India's position in multilateral sphere. Particularly when the world is divided in terms of Russian war in Ukraine and geopolitical challenges from China. In this context, today's news article tries to highlight how India is striking a balance between the divided world and winning hearts. But before getting into the discussion, Syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. See, the purpose of diplomacy is to strengthen the nation it serves in relation to others by advancing the interest in its charge. Similarly, one of India's core principles of foreign policy is to work towards building a peaceful, secure and stable world, particularly through forging mutual beneficial relationship with developing countries. In that line, India is performing very well. I am saying this because India's engagement does not stop with the six days tour. After the tour, Mr. Modi will be in Washington in June for a state visit. This is a rare honor accorded by the US President. Only two Indian leaders had such honor in the past. They are President Savapalli Radhakrishnan in 1963 and former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in 2009. This visit will include numerous strategic moves to strengthen India-US ties. Almost immediately after his return from US, Mr. Modi will need to switch to opposing coalition. Here I am talking about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. As you all know, India assumed the SCO chairmanship for 2023. It will be hosting the SCO summit in 2023 scheduled for July 3 and 4. Mr. Modi is expected to receive China's President Xi Jinping, Russia's President Vladimir Putin, the Pakistan Prime Minister Shabash Sharif, the leaders of Central Asian countries, the soon to be added SEO members, the President of Iran Ibrahim Raisi and the President of Belarus Alexander Lukashenko and other guests as well. If you look at the membership of SEO, it includes almost every nation that the West has sanctioned. SEO is largely an anti-Western alliance. That is why I said SEO is the opposing coalition. So the forum helps India to express the shared opposition to arbitrary sanctions like those imposed on Russia. A week after the SEO summit, Mr. Modi will revert to European Union as chief guest at France National Bastille Day Parade. He might visit other European capitals during the visit as well. In August, again there will be a huge turn with the BRICS summit in South Africa. Here, Mr. Modi will engage with other leaders to discuss an alternative BRICS payment mechanism to the dollar-dominated international system and to build a counter-narrative to the US-European Union combined. Again in September, Mr. Modi will host every global leaders at the G20 summit in Delhi. Here the author says that all these engagements did not come overnight. Clearly, autonomous strategy or multi-alignment over the past few years have paid off India in this critical year. Now, 
India is setting a trend of being a balancing force. Finally, the author concludes by saying that even though India's efforts have paid off, India will still face multilateral challenges if it could not strike a balance in any one of the multilateral meetings that we are going to host or participate. So, we will wait and see what will happen in future. That's all. With this, let us move on to our next article. This front page news article says that Supreme Court upheld the state legislature which recognized the bull taming event as a part of cultural heritage of people of Tamil Nadu. The bull taming event referred here is Jallikattu. Supreme Court said that Jallikattu is a type of bovine sport existing in Tamil Nadu for at least a century. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, we will understand about the Jallikattu and the issues surrounding it. But before that, note down the syllabus that I have given you for your reference. Now, first of all, let us see what is Jallikattu. See, Jallikattu is also known as Yeru Thaluvudal. It is a bull timing sport traditionally played in Tamil Nadu as a part of Pungal Harvest Festival. It will be celebrated on Mattu Pungal Day, which is third day of Pungal Festival. Know that the term Jallikattu was derived from the Tamil words Jalli and Kattu. Jalli refers to gold or silver coins and Kattu means tied. The sport got this name because silver or gold coins will be tied to the bull's horn. This is only considered as the price for whoever tames the bull. Let us say that no one was able to tame a bull, then it means that the bull has won. The winning bull will be served with the cows to preserve the native breed. This is about the Jallikattu sport. See, this sport has been renowned as an ancient sport which has been practiced since 2500 years ago. However, the practice of Jallikattu has been contested. It is because of the concern over cruelty to animal and the dangerous nature of the sport. It is a known fact that sometimes the sport causes death and injuries to both bulls and human participants. Due to this reason, animal rights groups like People for Ethical Treatment of Animals that is PETA approached the court with the documentary evidence. They said that in Jallikattu, animals are physically and mentally tortured. So, the Supreme Court in Welfare Board of India versus A. Nagaraja case banned the practice of Jallikattu. The Supreme Court ruled that Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960 overshadows or overrides the so-called tradition and culture. All this happened in 2014. Following this, a massive agitation erupted on Marina Beach in Chennai and it spread to remaining parts of Tamil Nadu as well. In June 2017, the protest is to demand the central and state governments to come up with the law that would annul the Supreme Court's ban on Jallikattu. Because of the intensity of the protest, an ordinance was promulgated. It is the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Tamil Nadu Amendment Ordinance 2017. Subsequently, the Assembly adopted a bill to replace the ordinance. This again was referred to Supreme Court. Because the animal rights group filed petitions to Supreme Court to ask the states to follow the ban imposed by Supreme Court in 2014. But Supreme Court opined that Jallikattu issue involved a substantial question of interpretation of the constitution and referred this matter to constitutional bench. That judgment only came now. In its judgment, Supreme Court upheld the amendments made by the Tamil Nadu. In other words, it upheld the prevention of cruelty to animals. Tamil Nadu Amendment Act of 2017 and Prevention to Cruelty of Animals Conduct of Jallikattu Rules of 2017. Supreme Court added that the 2017 amendment minimizes the cruelty to animal in the concerned sports. Because of this, hereafter Jallikattu will not come under the definition of cruelty defined in the 1960 Act. Moreover, Supreme Court said that the amendment received presidential assent. So, there is no need to think that there is any flaw in state action. To back up the amendment, Supreme Court said that the 2017 amendment does not violate articles 51A class G and 51A class H. These two articles impose duties on Indian citizens to protect the environment and develop a scientific temper, humanism and spirit of inquiry and reform respectively. Further, it also held that the amendment did not violate article 14, right to equality and article 21, right to life of the Indian constitution. That's all regarding this article. Take a look at this news article. It talks about the new deforestation regulations approved by the European Union. The new regulation attempts to ensure that the products consumed by EU citizens do not contribute to deforestation or forest degradation worldwide. The new European Union regulations will affect the imports from produce grown on land where deforestation has taken place after December 2020 and will kick in for larger companies from December 2024 with smaller businesses required to comply by June 2025. Four levels of penalties have been planned for any violation of this norm, which include monetary fines up to 4% of a firm's annual turnover in the European Union. It also includes confiscation of products, 
confiscation of revenues gained from a transaction and exclusion from the public procurement processes so the guidelines pose a threat to indian exports of items like coffee leather paper and wooden furniture india is already in the shock of european union's carbon border tax this is what is given in this news article in this context let us quickly go through some of the important points about what is carbon border tax i hope you all know how carbon trading works the only difference here is the boundary while the carbon trading happens within a country european union uses carbon trading in a different manner as a penalty to eliminate the producers that have higher carbon footprint let us see how it works in terms of carbon border adjustment mechanism the eu importers are mandated to purchase carbon certificates equal to the carbon price that would have been paid if the goods had been produced in accordance with the european union's carbon pricing rules if the carbon price is already paid in the country from where it originated or produced then the corresponding cost for the european union importer can be fully deducted so by means of making the product with higher carbon footprint costlier european union is trying to eliminate the risk of carbon leakage and it encourages non european union producers to green their manufacturing process in simple words cbam is a penalty tax to discourage import of carbon intensive goods like steel aluminium cement fertilizers and electricity into european union it primarily discourages environment unfriendly production and consumer practices by making the polluting sources costlier though this move can act as an incentive for consumers and producers in the european union to shift to more energy efficient sources and product it can severely affect developing countries like india which is one of the major steel producing countries and it is completely against the cbdr rc cbdr is nothing but common but differentiated responsibilities that's all regarding this article this article talks about green deposits it also talks about the rbi's regulatory framework regarding the green deposits in this discussion we will see about the points mentioned in the article in detail firstly what is a green deposit the green deposit is similar to other regular deposits that bank accept from their customers but with a slight difference the difference is that if a bank receives a green deposit from a customer it exclusively earmarks the amount for investing in environment friendly projects for example let us consider an imaginary person named siddharth malaya whose father is very rich siddharth malaya purchases a high polluting suv later he felt guilty about the pollution caused by his diesel guzzling suv so to make himself feel better he decides to deposit rupees 25 crore as a green deposit with sbi sid malaya will earn interest on his 25 crore and as a small satisfaction that his amount will be used for some green project sbi on the other hand will invest this 25 crore exclusively on the environment friendly projects like solar energy or wind energy or waste management invest here does not mean sba will directly start a solar farm or wind farm instead sba will provide this 25 crore as a loan to individuals and companies that are involved in environment friendly projects this is about the working of green deposit moving forward let us see about the rba regulatory framework regarding green deposit firstly banks that receive green deposit from their customers should come up with a set of rules or policies on how to invest the amount and this policy must be approved by the bank's board secondly the rules or policies regarding how the amount will be invested by the bank should be made public thirdly the bank must also make public all the information regarding the amount of green deposit received and how these deposits were allocated towards various green projects and the impact of such investments on environment this information must be verified by a third party to ensure the accountability of the banks finally the rba has specified certain sectors in which the banks can make investment using the green deposits the areas that qualify for investment using green deposits include renewable energy waste management clean transportation energy efficiency and afforestation rba bars the bank from investing in fossil fuels nuclear power tobacco gambling palm oil and hydropower generation using the amount received via green deposit here note that hydropower generation though a renewable source of power generation it is not eligible to receive investment via proceeds from the green deposits now you may have a question why rba had placed such regulation rba has placed these regulations to prevent green washing here what is green washing it is a scenario in which a company or organization tries to make people believe that their products or activities are environment friendly when they actually aren't they may use misleading claims and marketing techniques to make it seem like they are doing good for the planet but in reality they might not be taking meaningful actions 
the practice of greenwashing will deceive people who want to make environmentally responsible choices. This is why RBI has placed such stringent regulations on green deposit. Finally, let us see the pros and cons of green deposits. The supporters of green deposits feel that putting money into green projects may be one of the best ways to help the environment. But it also has a fair share of criticism. Firstly, the avenues that banks can invest using the amount received via green deposits is limited. Secondly, the critics of green deposits feel that it is basically a feel-good scam. Investors who invest in green deposits feel good about themselves and that these investments don't really do much good to the environment. These are some of the criticisms about the green deposits. That's all regarding this discussion. Look at this news article. This news article about the recently concluded state elections in Karnataka. As you all know, the Congress party won the election. There was a slight tussle over the appointment of chief minister. Finally, it was decided that Mr. Siddharamaya would be the next CM of Karnataka and Mr. Shivakumar would be the deputy CM. You may wonder how this news article is relevant for our examination. Actually, the information given in the article is not very relevant. But we can expect questions from the polity static part associated with the news. So in our discussion today, we will focus on how the CM is appointed. The position of chief minister in the state government is similar to the position of prime minister in the central government. The chief minister is the de facto executive and the head of the government in the state. Like in the case of prime minister, the constitution does not contain any specific procedure for the selection and appointment of the chief minister. We have got only article 164 to our aid. But this article also just mentions that the chief minister shall be appointed by the governor and does not elaborate further on the appointment procedure. So, going by the mere text of the article, does it mean the governor is free to appoint anyone as the chief minister? No. According to the conventions of the parliamentary democratic system that is followed in India, the governor appoints the leader of the majority party in the state legislative assembly as the chief minister. But what happens when there is no clear cut majority? In such scenario, the governor can use his situational discretion and appoint the leader of the largest party or coalition in the assembly as the chief minister. In both the cases, the chief minister candidate must prove his majority in the house through a vote of conference within a month. Here you have to note one thing. The constitution does not require a person to prove his majority in the legislative assembly before that person is appointed as the chief minister. The governor might first appoint him as the chief minister and then ask him to prove his majority in the legislative assembly within a reasonable period. Also, note that a person who is not a member of the state legislature, that is legislative assembly or legislative council can also be appointed as the chief minister if that person can prove his majority in the legislative assembly through a vote of confidence. But that person must get himself elected either to the legislative assembly or to the council within six months. Finally, what happens when the chief minister dies when he is in office? In such a scenario, the ruling party normally elects a new leader and the governor has to appoint him as the chief minister. The new CM must also prove his majority in the legislative assembly. In case the party does not appoint any new leader, then the governor can appoint a person using his discretion and ask him to prove his majority. Once the CM is appointed by, the governor administers the oath of office and secrecy. The term of chief minister is not fixed and he holds office during the pleasure of the governor. However, this does not mean that the governor can dismiss him at any time. He cannot be dismissed by the governor as long as he enjoys the majority support in the legislative assembly. But if he loses the confidence of the assembly, he must resign or the governor can dismiss him. That's all regarding this discussion. As a part of the discussion, we saw all the necessary points related to the appointment of chief minister. In future videos, we will see the other aspects of the CM like his powers and function. Now let us conclude this and take up the next article. This article is about menstrual health. The article captured various aspects of menstrual health like menstrual stigma, period poverty and the impacts period poverty has on health and education. In this discussion, we will see all the points discussed in the article in detail. First, let us see the basics about menstruation. Menstruation is a natural biological process that occurs in certain female mammals including humans. It is a monthly cycle in which the lining of the uterus is shed through bleeding. During menstruation, the uterus prepares itself for the potential pregnancy. If the fertilization that is the fusing of sperm and egg occurs, then the pregnancy cycle begins. If the fertilization does not occur, the lining of uterus along with the blood and tissue is shed through vagina. This process usually lasts for a few days and is accompanied by various physical and hormonal changes in the body. In addition to humans, there are few other mammals that also undergo a similar process. These animals include some primates such as chimpanzees, bonobos and gorillas. 
in addition certain species of bats elephant shoes and some species of fruit bats also exhibit menstrual cycle having seen the basics about menstruation now we will see what is menstrual health menstrual health is not an unidimensional concept rather it has many dimensions to it it basically includes the physical emotional and social well being of individuals during menstruation physical well being involves regularity and predictability of the menstrual cycle emotional well being involves having a positive attitude towards menstruation and handling the emotions carefully during the hormonal changes social well being involves increasing access to safe and hygienic menstrual products and proper sanitation facilities so that individuals can manage their menstruation with dignity and without hindrance all these are important aspects of menstrual health now why is menstrual health important and why should the government allocate significant resources to ensure menstrual health this is because menstrual health is linked to five of the 17 united nations sustainable development goals but how let me explain we already know that menstrual cycle is multi dimensional to ensure menstrual health focus must be provided on things like ending poverty ensuring good health providing quality education ensuring gender equality and providing clean water and sanitation see these five conditions that are necessary to ensure menstrual health are part of un sdg goals this is the main reason governments must focus on providing menstrual health and ensuring menstrual health indirectly helps the country achieve the five of the 17 sustainable development goals and that's all about the menstrual health and the need to ensure menstrual health moving forward let us see some points about the term period poverty what is period poverty period poverty refers to economic constraints that lead to lack of access to menstrual products education hygiene facilities waste management or combination of these basically when people are not able to afford menstrual products menstrual hygiene facilities and waste management due to their poor economic condition then those people are said to be in period poverty according to the article period poverty affects nearly 500 million individuals particularly those in low middle income and low income groups globally this article also talks about the impacts of period poverty the first impact is period poverty hampers access to education limited access to menstrual products and inadequate sanitation facilities acts as a barrier to education particularly for young girls many girls miss school during their periods due to lack of proper menstrual management and sanitation facilities in their school the second impact is health sometimes due to economic constraints women resort to unhygienic practices during menstruation these unhygienic practices increase the risk of infections including the reproductive and urinary tract infections the last and the major impact of period poverty is gender inequality period poverty reinforces gender inequalities and discrimination period poverty marginalizes women and girls from low income backgrounds it hinders their ability to fully participate in society and limits their opportunities for personal and professional growth this further increases the gender disparities these are the major impacts of period poverty how can period poverty be addressed first is increasing the access to sanitation facilities next is by providing access to free menstrual hygiene products and finally focus must be provided on educating the community about the menstrual hygiene these steps will go a long way in addressing the period poverty that's all regarding this discussion Look at this front page article here. The news is that Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu laid the foundation stone for the 33 crore rupees Purunai Museum proposed in Tirunelveli. This proposed museum is going to showcase artifacts from Purunai civilization. This is the crux of the article given here. Now in this context let us learn some points about Purunai civilization. First of all know that Purunai is the ancient name of the river Thamira Barani. The river Purunai is mentioned by the names Tan Purunai, Purunal and Purundam in Sangam era Tamil literature. The name Tanpurunai finds a place in Tolkapiyam which is an ancient treatise on Tamil grammar apart from this Tanpurunai is also mentioned in Sangam work Purananuru researchers say that the name Tanpurunai has evolved into Thamira Purunai and later it become Thamira Barani now coming to Purunai civilization see the civilization that flourished around the banks of Purunai or Thamira Barani river in ancient times is what termed as Purunai civilization The Purunai civilization falls in the present day Tirunelveli and Thoothukudi districts of Tamil Nadu. Know that Adichanallur, Korkai and Sivakalai are some of the excavation sites located on the banks of river Purunai. The excavated materials from these sites provide some valuable information about the Purunai civilization. In the year 2020, the excavations at Adichanallur site were resumed after one and a half decade by the Archaeological Survey of India team. The ASA team found a skull of a buried person that is believed to be 3000 years old. 
with that skull the ac team has also found a gold diadem bronze artifacts headgear spear arrowheads dog tie and paddy see all these materials were buried alongside the remains these excavations contribute to the study of purunai civilization it is believed that purunai civilization dates back to 3200 years old so purunai civilization is considered to be much older than the vaigai river civilization which is believed to be around 2600 years old but how do people say purunai civilization is 3200 years old in 2021 the scientists from the united states carbon dated and analyzed the rice and soil that was earlier found in the burial urn at sivakalai excavation site the results showed that the rice and soil date back to 3200 years this is almost as old as the indus valley civilization after these findings tamil nadu chief minister announced the construction of purunai museum in tamil nadu legislative assembly in september 2021 and yesterday the cm laid the foundation stone for the purunai museum this proposed museum is going to showcase artifacts that are excavated from the sites of purunai civilization now before concluding our discussion let us learn some points about the tamarabarni river see the tamarabarni river originates from the agastyar kudam peak of podige hills of the western ghats it flows through tirunelveli and thootukuri districts of tamil nadu and merges into gulf of mannar of the bay of bengal This river has a distinct reddish tint because the water contains copper. As I said earlier, Tamarabarni River is mentioned in ancient Tamil Sangam texts. The rivers such as Payar, Ullar, Karayar, Serwalar, Manimuttar, Gadana, Pachayar and Chittar are some of the important tributaries of the Tamarabarni River. That's all about this discussion. Through this discussion, we have learned some points about Purunai civilization and about the Tamarabarni River. With this, let us move on to next part of our discussion. That is practice prelims question discussion. Today we will be discussing four questions. I will solve three of them, and one question is quiz question for you. Now let us take up our first question. According to the recent RBI regulation, in which of the following sectors banks can invest via amount received from green deposits? Here the correct answer is option D, one and two only. from our discussion we know that rbi has designated sectors like renewable energy excluding hydro power waste management clean transportation energy efficiency and afforestation for the investment that bank can make via the amount received through green deposits so the correct answer is option d with this let us move on to our next question the name purunai is the ancient name of which of the following rivers the answer is option c tamarabarni river this question is pretty simple and easy right now let us move on to our next question In this question two statements about CBAM that is carbon border adjustment mechanism is given and we have to choose the correct ones first statement says that it will impose a border fee on imports in carbon intensive sectors from nations with lower environmental standards this statement is correct CBAM will impose a border fee on imports in carbon intensive sectors like steel cement and fertilizers from the nation with lower environmental standards than the European Union Second statement says that recently the European Commission's Fit to 55 package introduces this CBAM. This statement is also correct. Recently, European Commission adopted the Fit for 55 package of proposals. It aims to make the European Union's climate, energy, land use, transportation and taxation policies fit for lowering greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 relative to 1990 levels. The Fit for package opens new market for Indian industry for example electric vehicles however it also introduces a globally unprecedented carbon border adjustment mechanism for pricing imported carbon so the correct answer here is option C both 1 and 2 and this question is your quiz question think well and comment the correct answer below in this slide mains practice questions are given interested aspirants can write their answers and post it in the comment section With this we have come to end of our discussion if you found this video useful hit the like button do comment and share it with your fellow aspirants and most importantly subscribe to shankar ias academy's youtube channel for more content about upsc preparation thanks for listening patiently have a nice day